Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Beverly Baptist Church Online Worship. Whether you're a regular member of our congregation, a former member, a friend, or just somebody who's found us online, you are most welcome as we worship God together. Separated, yes, by distance, uh, separated perhaps by time if you're watching this video at a later point, but we're united by his Holy Spirit. If you're watching this as a family, you might want to do what we did last week and, and take a photo and send it uh, to the WhatsApp group. But there's no reason why the adults can't do that as well. But I know our children particularly appreciated seeing one another last week and, and seeing what they did together in Sunday school. It was fascinating. The different personalities coming out as as different families and children took the material and explored it in their own way. And we all benefited from sharing that together. My role this morning is to bring the parts of our service together. Ian and Julia will be leading our song worship and Stephen will be bringing us a talk a little later on, the last in our short series from Romans, looking at the cross. As we come to worship, let us pause for a moment and prepare ourselves to experience the presence of God. Now let's lift our hearts and our voices together in praise and worship. Let's just collect our thoughts and just gather together for some uh, for worship together. Um, a song that's been going through my mind all of this week is the new Wren Collective song, which is called I Choose to Worship. I'll just share with you some of the lyrics from that. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my song. In the valley, you are worthy. You are good when life is not. You will always and forever be my song. Let's sing together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
Yes, we do indeed praise you, the Saviour, Jesus Christ. Praise you for the sacrifice that you made. And we do thank you for all that you've done for us. And we pray you will continue to be with us during this service today. In your name. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you and praise you that you are the ever-living one. You know the end from the beginning and you hold the whole of human history in your hands. In this time of uncertainty and chaos, when many are fearful and confused, we thank you that we know that you are holding the world in your hands. You love all that you have made. Your heart breaks as you see that this world is broken. Reassure us, Lord, of your love for us today. That even in these days, as the psalmist says, you will not abandon us. Lord, we confess that too often we turn our back on you. We do not hear what you are saying. We do not live as you want us to. Forgive us, we pray. Thank you that your love and acceptance of us is not because of what we do or do not do, but because of what Jesus has done for us in his death and resurrection and because you love us. We thank you, and we offer you our praise and our worship in him. Amen. The notices are brief this week. Uh, just to say, please continue, continue to keep in touch with one another. Do please let us know if you need help. Uh, I know there's been lots of people shopping for one another this week. That's fantastic. Uh, we can always manage more, uh, particularly now the supermarkets are becoming uh, better stocked again. Uh, so please do reach out if you need anything that anyone in the church community might be able to help with at this time. And please do keep an eye on your email in particular. Uh, because that will continue to be our primary means of communicating anything uh, that we think the whole community needs to know. Uh, because that is the communication means that pretty much everybody has. So it's the easiest way of getting important things to the whole church community. Last week, our amazing Crunchy Fairies managed to deliver crunchies to some who were celebrating you may have seen the pictures on Facebook uh, of some of those who got their crunchies. The great news is that the Crunchy Fairies are willing to use their allocated exercise quota to hopefully continue that service. So if you are eligible for Crunchy this week, you have something to celebrate, whatever that might be, please do post it on the Facebook page or email it to Karen and we will do our best to get chocolate to you. Uh, so that you can celebrate in the time-honoured BBC fashion. I just want us to think for a moment, and this might be something, if you're watching with somebody else, that you want to, to think about together, uh, just before we come to a time of prayer. Because life is very different for us all at the moment. Uh, even since last Sunday, the rules of what we can do have changed again. And this will affect us in different ways. We will struggle with different things. And I cannot say it enough at this time that how you are dealing with this and how you are coping with this is fine. Because that is you. Nobody else can tell you what you should be feeling, what you should be struggling with, how you should be dealing with this situation. Because we're all individuals. But yes, we are individuals, but actually we can also think sometimes in terms of particular groups within our church and our society who might need prayer in particular ways at this time. You might want to just pause the video perhaps and have a think about what some of those groups might be. Or keep watching and I've got some ideas that I want to suggest too. One group is our children and our young people. And for you, 
I guess probably the biggest change at the moment is you're not going to school and your other activities that you enjoy doing you're not able to see your friends and that's really hard so you might want to think of some of the children in our church and pray for them by name that they'll be able to find enjoyable things to do at the moment be able to keep in touch with friends in some way uh, and still to learn about the world even when they're not in school another group perhaps would be parents and families be a big adjustment to having the children at home you might want to think of some of the parents in our church who you know maybe your own parents or other families pray that they will have patience they'll be able to help their children at this time that there wouldn't be too many fights perhaps even somehow miraculously that families would be drawn closer together by this experience for some of the older people in our church they've been told they shouldn't go out at all for the next 12 weeks and that's really hard that means they need somebody else to do their shopping it means they could be very lonely so let's pray for them that they would know God with them another group of people in our church or their families can't go to work and for some of them, that means they won't get paid, which can be very worrying. Other people, another group of people in our church, have a lot more work. If they work in hospitals or the health work at the moment, they might be being asked to do lots of extra hours. Be very tired, be very worried how to look after these sick people. They need our prayers. It's good to remember all these different groups of people and indeed everyone in our church at this time. So do think who are your friends in the church? Who are those in the church whose names and situations you know? Pray for them now and keep praying for them over the course of this week. <coughs> We're going to pray now. We're going to begin our prayers with our children who may then wish to start looking at the Sunday school materials for this week. One advantage, I keep finding little advantages to this online video format, is you can move seamlessly into Sunday school uh, without disturbing anybody else. Uh, so please do feel free to do that at any point uh, that you wish to shift your focus. And I look forward to seeing the pictures of what you all get up to this week. But let us pray. Lord, we do pray for our children and our young people. At this time of uncertainty, changes of routines, when they can't see their friends, when they can't go to school. Lord, we pray that you will help them to adjust to this new situation. That you will help them to find the words to express how they are feeling when they need somebody to talk to or somebody to help that you'll enable them to find ways to keep in touch with their friends and that they will know that you are with them at this time and we pray for them particularly in the activities they're doing this morning that they will meet you there. That they will know your love and your care. And we pray for their parents too and their families. Adjusting to being school teachers. Not school teachers, but primary teachers for their children at this time. And all the changes that that brings. We pray for our church families at this time. They need divine intervention to deal with the situations they are encountering. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our church families. We pray for those in our church who for reasons of age or ill health are completely isolated at this time. We pray that they might feel able to reach out. 
that they would find those who can help with their practical needs. They will find those who can be a listening ear. And they will find you to be a listening ear too. And they might know that they are not alone, even if they are the only person in their house, that you are with them. We pray for those for whom work is a worry at this time, whether that's lack of work and the lack of income that goes with that, or whether that's overwork and the stress and the tiredness that goes with that. We pray that you will truly be all that is needed to those who are struggling and uncertain what the future holds. And we continue to pray particularly for those in our congregation in the health service at this time. They, they might not be treating anybody with the virus, but everything's more stretched. The resources are having to go further. A lot of uncertainty. We pray that you will build them up and empower them to do what they need to do at this time. Lord, we know that it's not just people in our church who are affected. I put a no doubt asking if anybody had any prayer requests for this week and Lord we pray for Peter and Mary Jean who are friends of Nigel and Mary uh, from Swaziland and Peter having gone to the States for medical treatments now can't get home again and so Mary Jean is left uh, running uh, an AIDS orphan farm and school on her own. Lord, we pray that you would give her all that she needs at this time. And Lord, we could name, each of us could name others. And there are countless hundreds and thousands of unnamed people around the world for whom these prayers are equally valid. A quarter of the world is on lockdown. all struggling to understand what this means. Lord, help us to know, help us to trust that you are there in the midst of this time. Help us to carry one another, to carry one another's burdens, to seek to meet one another's needs as we are able. But Lord, most of all, give us each everything that we need for our own needs. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. That in every way, you would be equipping us at this time and enabling us to live for you, whatever that means, whatever that looks like as this changes from week to week. Lord, on one level it seems strange at the moment. This takes up so much of our thought and our prayers. But Lord, it is right that it does so, because it is our lives. And will be for some time. Help us Lord to continue to lift this situation to you. And to pray in faith. That even in this time you will bring good things. And that we might be strengthened in our faith. And brought together as a community. For we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. 
beginning to read at verse 15. Romans chapter 6, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that... Though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies... She is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. Lord, as we ponder these words together, and hear now what you have laid on Stephen's heart to share with us. May you speak to each one of us by your Holy Spirit. Amen. The last few weeks we've been looking through the eyes of Paul in his letter to the church in Rome at the significance of Easter, and specifically Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection, and how that brings about our salvation. It's an important book of the Bible, but it's difficult in places. The, me the church's men's group have wrestled with Romans for months. We've struggled to get agreement on some of the questions posed in our study guides, but we've learned a lot. We've grown together in our discussions and in some of our confusion and some of our head scratching. This particular passage is grace filled and it's coming to a pinnacle uh, part of Romans with fundamental truths within it. It talks of us being dead to sin. Sin is no longer our slave master. Christ, through his grace, has bought us 
through his death on the cross. And Paul commands us to turn our back on our old way of being, a shameful existence, he calls it, that has nothing but the stench of death about it. And to live fruitful lives in Christ Jesus, because that, le because that leads to eternal life. The message itself is simple, but we still need to digest it a bit as it uses some concepts that will be somewhat foreign to us today. It talks of slavery and it talks of references. It makes references to the law. It talks of sin and death and righteousness, and it's got a likening of Jesus to marriage within there. There are probably three parts to this. It's a typical Baptist thing to have a three part sermon. And I would suggest that the first part is that we're all slaves to something. In the passage, as it's been read in the NIV format. It talks a great deal about us being slaves, slaves to sin or slaves to Christ. Verse 19. In chapter six. Paul says he's using a language the readers can relate to. But the true reality of slavery is a concept many of us will know very little about. The New Testament church would have understood the concept of slaves. Paul uses slaves and masters at times, many times, in fact, in his letters as, as an example of Christian living. In Philemon, for example, he commends Onesimus when he sends him back to his owner, an owner that the slave has run away from. Onesimus was owned by someone in the same way that we're owned by God. And sometimes we run away from him. Slaves were commonplace in society at that time. Many wealthy families would have had slaves. That's probably it's akin to the way Downton Abbey has servants. Our professional families might have an au pair, nannies, cooks. Perhaps we have cleaners. There's a difference in that they would be treated in a very different way. Slaves were confined to a particular place, subject to a higher to a higher power, a master, and they would have little if any, civil liberties. I've asked in preparing this whether this is culturally relevant, this the slave part of it. It's culturally relevant to us today. How can we link with it? Slavery does continue, but I doubt we know very little about it. I don't think we understand the practice of keeping slaves as property to buy a commodity that is a human life. But this week, perhaps, this week, we might just relate a little bit more to having to, to, to the concept of having our civil liberties curtailed. A month ago, we went to work, we walked in parks, we met together in groups, we bought rice and pasta and toilet rolls. This week, it's very different. A higher power insists that we stay at home. We're told not to meet together. We don't work in the same way as we did just a week ago. Our children don't even go to school. We even have limits imposed upon us when buying goods in shops. Some shops aren't open. Others we can only order online. The ones that are open, we have to queue up outside and wait until, until we're told we can go in. And when we go in, we have limits, caps on the amount of items, certain items we can purchase. Perhaps after this week, 
we do have a better understanding of our restricted freedoms. I say freedoms, but we're talking about slaves, aren't we? Slaves are thus because they don't have those same freedoms that general society is granted. It seems quite a paradox then, doesn't it, that we exchange the word slavery for freedom. It doesn't seem quite right to interchange the two words, but this passage, when we read, when we read it in the message, the paraphrase, the message, we see that the, the message doesn't use the word slave at all. It talks about freedom, our freedom to choose. Let me read you a little bit. So, since we're out from under the old tyranny, does that mean we can live an, the, uh, any old way we want? Since we're free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourselves to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. But offer yourselves to the ways of God and freedom never quits. All your lives you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master. One whose commands set you free to live openly in freedom. I'm using the freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time, the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. And how much different. It is now, as you live in God's freedom, your lives healed and expansive in holiness. Perhaps it's easier to understand or perhaps it's just more palatable to say we have freedom to choose rather than we are, rather than the fact that we are slaves. We have freedom to choose between sin and Christ. Now let me qualify that a little bit by, say, by stating a few facts. We are human beings. Human beings are born into a sinful world. We are all sinful. We're all slaves to sin, but in accepting Jesus Christ, we have a choice to continue living that sinful life or choose to align ourselves to Christ. We will still sin, that's a given. We will consciously and unconsciously do wrong. Accepting Jesus gives us a new hope and promise of heaven, not immunity to being sinful. I spoke last year about the Sermon on the Mount, and there are many parallels in what Paul says here in Romans to Jesus's words in Matthew 5. I think we should probably find that comforting that, and, and reassuring even that Paul's theology is aligned to Jesus's words. While speaking on the topic, I used an analogy which is as relevant for this passage as it was for that. Without wanting to overwork it, I'm sure I can use it just one more time. So here it is. One evening, an old Cherokee told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil, it's anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It's joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, 
compassion and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? And the old Cherokee simply replied, the one you feed. We are the product of what we do, of what we say, and what we think. We're the product of how we live. We even subscribe to the notion that we are what we eat. Or as the message says, we are what we express as our freedom. The rebellious teenager often finds the ways in which they choose to express their freedom soon become the ruthless master. Whether it be tobacco or alcohol, sex or drugs, the pursuit of their freedom from parental guidance can very easily become their controlling captor. As Christians, we know we have eternal life. We're saved from that death that comes from being slaves to sin. Verse 15 asks a similar question to verse 1. Phil unpacked that a little bit last week. So it wasn't a little bit. Phil unpacked that last week. Both verses essentially ask if we can, con if we can just continue as before. Continue, the continue in the way we know since we know that we're forgiven. Knowing that as sin increases, grace increases all the more. And to both these questions, we're given an, we're given an emphatic, certainly not, or heaven forbid. We mustn't let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Yes, we're inherently sinful, fact. We're part of humanity, a sinful race since Adam. But we are to count ourselves dead to sin. We're to choose a different master. We're to choose a different type of freedom. Sin, it says, is wickedness, impurity. It did nothing but brought us shame and it leads to death, whereas making ourselves slaves to Christ gives rise to holiness, righteousness. Understanding that we're set free and that that leads to eternal life. Our challenge is to decide which type of slave we want to be. What type of freedom choice we want to live by. So we're all slaves to something. But that's not the end of it. Because the second point I'd like to make is that Christ conquered sin and death. There's a massive chasm between life and death. Someone in the church helpfully illustrated this recently by describing life and death as being on either side of that chasm and that that chasm can be bridged by the cross of Jesus. It's only by the cross that we can pass from one side to the other, from death to life. If we fully understand that, if we fully understand that we have a promise of eternal life, it's incumbent upon us to choose to live the life we're called to and recognise, as verse 11 puts it in the message, sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on every word. We speak a new language, a language given to us by Christ Jesus' sacrifice. 
the sinless saviour, Jesus, died for us. He died for the sinful by being nailed to a cross so that we could live. He poured out his love for us in an act of grace given freely to each and every person who's willing to accept it. When we talk about the freedoms we have, we have them because we are under grace. Paul talks a lot about the law. He says that people are now under grace and not under the law. Now, Paul knows that some of the Roman citizens he's actually writing to, they adhere to the law. And in some respects, that's a good thing. But they're doing it in an they're doing it and they're seeing it to be an authoritative code. And not a relationship with their creator. Jesus said the same in Matthew 5. I came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. And the Sermon on the Mount in the same passage addressed people's attitudes to being free in Christ. Rather than a narrow focused legalistic tick box exercise to faith. To address this, Paul uses an example of a marriage. And he explains that the death of a partner terminates the relationship and that this release from the marriage enables that person to be joined to another. He's saying that death to the law brings about a freedom to build relationship with the one who created us to be righteous. And all this is achieved by grace in the one who died and rose again for us. Now we've got to be careful with our theology here. American pastor and Christian author Philip Yancey would probably call the notion of us continuing in our old sinful ways absurd. He actually calls this an act of grace abuse. He says that God took a risk in announcing forgiveness in advance. What's to stop anyone from sinning if they know in advance that they'll be forgiven for it later? Shakespeare's Prince Hamlet wouldn't kill the king at prayer in the chapel unless he knew he'd be forgiven for it and still go to heaven. Surely that's using that same logic. Returning to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus points out that he's interested in our hearts being right. Not the adherence to lots of rules and regulations. Paul's saying the same here. He's urging us to become slaves to God. And the benefit we reap leads to holiness. He even asks us to work. Sorry. He even asks how it worked out for the Romans. Or we should ask how it works out for us when we lived slaves as slaves to sin. He suggests that, there, that when we were in the realms of flesh, the passions within us bore fruit for death. That's chapter seven, verse five. And that in choosing to put the old shameful things of our past lives behind us, we attain eternal life. More than that, he's almost goading people in chapter 6, verse 21, when he asks, what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, 
the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Paul prompts us to choose holiness, to freely choose to be slaves to Jesus because he's bridged the gap between death and eternal life through grace brought about by the death, by his death and resurrection on the cross. So we're all slaves to something. But there's good news that Jesus has bridged that gap to allow us to, to move from being slaves to sin, to being slaves to Christ. And our third point is that we can serve fruitfully in the spirit. Chapter seven, verse four tells us that if we choose to live as slaves to Christ, we've been bought as slaves by another, by Jesus, through the death and resurrection of Christ. In recognising this, our purpose has to be to bear fruit for God. But how do we do that? First and foremost, if this chapter tells us anything, <coughs> excuse me, it tells us we must choose to serve only one master. We'll never be effective trying to serve two masters. To risk overusing that, uh, that analogy from earlier, we have to choose which wolf we're going to feed. We have to decide what slave or what freedom we're going to choose. And we have to choose Jesus if we're going to receive from God and bear fruit for him. And the reason why we have to uh, decide Sorry. The reason why we have to decide which way we're going to go is is shown in a le in in letters to an American lady where C.S. Lewis quotes St. Augustine as saying, God gives where he finds empty hands. And Lewis adds, a man whose hands are full of parcels can't receive a gift. Jesus wants to give us a gift. He wants us to be fruitful for him. He wants to give us sufficient grace and power that we're effective for him. And we know the true freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. So to conclude, we can only truly grow and bear fruit in God if we fully turn our back on the things that ensnare us and we choose to be slaves for Christ. We recognise that Christ Jesus' grace has bought us from our slavery that leads to death. And in doing this, we need to empty our hands, ready to accept all that God has for us to be fruitful for him. Amen. Let's join together in our, in our final song, which follow, following from Stephen's sermon. This is amazing grace. Let's sing together.
foolish and failing love That you would take my place brings our chaos back into order, who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the king of glory, the king of all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of us. Thank you to all those who have been involved in this service of worship, those who have been visible on screen, and also those behind the scenes. Particular mention for Josh Heng, who has once again pulled together the separate videos and edited them into the finished act of worship, which we have just shared together. If you are a regular at Beverly Baptist and you're watching this on Sunday morning, please do try to join us for the virtual coffee time over Zoom in a few minutes. If anyone is still unable to access Zoom and wishes to do so, uh, please do reach out to us this week and we'll do what we can to help you to get that working. And as we come to a close, a verse from an, an old hymn and a benediction from scripture. I am not skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at his right hand 
stands one who is my saviour. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory for ever. Amen. <laughs>